doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. So it was the spring of 2021, and it was the week of the NFL draft, and all teams in the NFL were kind of scouting out who they were going to draft that year for the next year, and the 49ers had the third pick of the overall draft. They traded up to get that pick, which is a great spot to be in, and they chose that year a young quarterback coming out of North Dakota State named Trey Lance. Now, this was a really controversial pick for the 49ers because they already had a quarterback named Jimmy Garoppolo. And if you're a longtime Packers fan, like you've seen this play out a couple of times, right? You have an established sitting quarterback. Your team has one of the the first round picks, a high first round pick. And what do they do? They go and draft a quarterback, even though they already have a really good quarterback. So, So going into the 2021 season, The plan is for Trey Lance to back up Jimmy Garoppolo, and then at some point in the future, he will take over for Jimmy Garoppolo. So they move through the 2021 season, and the 49ers have a really good year. They finish the year 10-7, and and they make it to the playoffs. And if you remember, they actually beat the Packers in the playoffs that year to go to the NFC Championship game where they ended up losing. Now, going into the 2022 season, they had a decision to make. They've drafted Trey Lance. He's backed up for one year. So what do they do? Do they go ahead and put him as the starter and either put Jimmy G as the backup or move on from him? All of this controversy through the spring, going into that season, they make the decision to make Trey Lance the starter and Jimmy Garoppolo the backup. And then it was the decision, well, what do we do? Do we keep Jimmy Garoppolo or move on? They ended up keeping him, which was a really good move because two games Second game in the season as Trey Lance is getting his second NFL start. Within the first quarter of the game, he breaks his ankle and he is out for the season. And so who has to come in and now play? Jimmy Garoppolo, which I would be so smug if I was him. Like, I'd have this chip on my shoulder. You tried to get rid of me, but you stuck with me, and here I am. So he ends up doing pretty well. He, they, they, he takes him on a 7-3 and three run that season. Now, during all of this controversy with Trey Lance and Jimmy Garoppolo, who's going to start? Going into the 2022 draft, the 49ers select yet another quarterback. They select a young guy named Brock Purdy in 2022. Now, this wasn't a controversial pick because he wasn't picked early in the draft. He was actually picked in the last round of the draft. And in fact, he was the last, the very last pick in the draft of 2022. Now, the NFL has a name. They have a title that they give the last person in the draft. The title is Mr. Irrelevant. That is the legit title, right? We got sad faces over here like, oh, poor guy, poor Brock, right? Now, when you get drafted, you get a a jersey with the team that drafted you and the number, usually the first person does. They gave him a jersey with his draft number, 262, with the title on the back, Mr. Irrelevant. That is handed to the last person of the draft. Now, in college football, there's the award known as the Heisman Award, right? The most prestigious award in college football. It's a trophy that looks like this. One college student gets it at the end of the year. What they give to Mr. Irrelevant isn't the Heisman it's the Lowe'sman. They actually give him a Lowe'sman. So the Heisman is like this tough guy who's running and stiff arming. The Lowe'sman is this scrawny football player with huge hands who is fumbling the football, right? So he's drafted 2022, the last pick of the draft, Mr. Irrelevant. Now, go back to the 2022 season. Trey Lance is out. They have to put Jimmy Garoppolo in to back him up. He plays about 10 games, and then on the first drive of the 11th week of the season, he gets injured with a season-ending injury, and who has to come in and now lead the 49ers? Mr. Irrelevant himself. Like, what a moment for him, right? And I wonder if you've followed all of this so far, if you've ever found yourself in a moment like that, not having to, like, go play an NFL football game, 
but you're thrust into a situation where the stakes are high, the pressure's on, and you feel, this is my moment. Like, I have to prove myself in this moment, and the pressure is on. Now, I don't know if Brock Purdy actually felt pressure in that moment. I don't know if he felt like, hey, I have to prove myself, but I do wonder if he didn't. I wonder if he went in and he said, I've got nothing to prove. I've got nothing to lose. I've already been labeled. I've already been identified. Nobody here is expecting me to do anything. Like when Jimmy Garoppolo went down, all the Niners fans and all of the NFL was like, their season is done, they're toast, they should just pack it up and start looking to next year. But Brock Purdy comes in and he goes on a tear. They're playing the Dolphins the week he goes in. He wins that game. The next week, I forget who they're playing, I think it's the Commanders. He wins that game. The next week he goes out and he wins that game. And then he wins the next. He takes them on an 8-0 and run, which is kind of unheard of for any rookie quarterback, especially the last person of the draft who's labeled Mr. Irrelevant. And it raises the question, like, how do you do that? When the pressure's on, when the stakes are high, when everybody's looking at you to do something and perform, how do you go out and live as though you've got nothing to prove and nothing to lose? Our passage this morning in John 1, I think, shows us how we get to that point where we can live as though we have nothing to prove and nothing to lose, because there's someone in our life who has done it all for us. This is how John 1, starting in verse 19, begins. Now, this was John's testimony. So, verse 19 is making a shift in John's gospel. Up to this point, there's what's called the prologue, verse 1 through 18. And there's all of this metaphorical, creative language and imagery trying to describe who Jesus is. And then there's this shift now to narrative. Now, even though there's a shift in verse 19, there's also a connection that's being made. Because in the prologue, John the Baptist, and that's who this is referencing. This John here isn't John who wrote the gospel, but it's John the Baptist. And there's a reference to him in verse 6 in chapter 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, that light being Jesus. And now we're told this is what his testimony is. Verse 19, this was John's testimony. This is what he came to say about Jesus. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. So the initial part of this interrogation is for this group of priests and Levites to figure out who, Jesus, who John is. And so this is his testimony, but notice what his testimony begins with. His testimony about Jesus begins with himself, but specifically who he's not. Verse 20, when they asked who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Now, part of why he's naming what he's not is because he's responding to the questions that are asked of him by the priests and the Levites. And the starting question is, are you the Messiah? Now, it's not in there in the text, but we can assume because his initial response is, well, I'm not the Messiah. And then they ask, well, are you Elijah? If you're not the Messiah, are you Elijah? Which is an Old Testament figure who was a prophet who had this grand exit from the world. If we remember in 2 Kings, Elijah was this man who didn't die. One of two individuals in the scriptures who didn't die. Even Jesus died. Elijah didn't die. Enoch is the other one in Genesis. Elijah is just swept up from the earth to heaven. And they're wondering, maybe you're Elijah who's come back. And then he says no to that. And then they ask him, are you the prophet? Not a prophet, but the prophet. Now, asking if he's Elijah and asking if he is the prophet, again, is references to Old Testament passages that created what we call a messianic expectation. There was this expectation in the first century Jewish world that their Savior was coming. 
They didn't know who he was. They didn't know when he was coming, but they knew there was a promise from the Old Testament that one day their Savior would come. And it was thought that Elijah and this individual who is the prophet would come around the time the Messiah comes. So if John the Baptist isn't the Messiah, they're thinking, maybe he's Elijah, and maybe he's the prophet. Now, Elijah is thought, it says at the end of the Old Testament, in Malachi, the last two verses of the Old Testament, it was, it was thought that Elijah was going to come before the Messiah because the last two verses of the Old Testament kind of say he's going to return. He, he didn't die. He was swept up to heaven. So when he comes, he will come to prepare the way of the Lord. And he's saying, no, I'm not that. In Deuteronomy 18, before Moses releases the people to cross into the promised land without him, he says to the, the Israelites, there will come a day where a prophet who is an, a prophet like me will come and lead his people. So again, there was this expectation that he might be one of these two individuals. Now, what I find to be so interesting about John the Baptist's statement as to who he is not, he seems to have clarity, confidence, and conviction about who he's not. Which might illustrate that knowing who you're not is just as important as knowing who you are. Knowing who you're not is just as important as knowing who you are. Because many of us, like Miss Jackie just demonstrated, spend a lot of time trying to be somebody we're not. We spend a lot of time looking at what everybody else has in the world and asking, how do I become like them? Like that was me in my 20s and 30s. For a better part of my 20s and 30s, I looked to other people and constantly asked, how is it that I can be like them? So as an as a individual who's a preacher, who, who speaks like this on a weekly basis, one of the things you're constantly doing is listening to other preachers and other speakers to try and learn from them and continue to grow. And when I was like growing up into this role, Rob Bell was like the marquee communicator of the late 90s, early 2000s. He was doing something called NUMA videos. Every young pastor was like, oh, how can I be like him? And so I used to listen to all of his sermons, and there were people who would come up to me after I would preach when I was just starting out, and they're like, you remind me of Rob Bell. And I was like, yeah, that's amazing, right? Tim Keller was another voice I listened to a lot early on, and people would come to me at times and tell me like, hey, your style reminds me of Tim Keller. I'm like, yes, that's right. That's who I am trying to be. But then there was a moment, and I'll never forget, that that started to shift for me, meaning I, I stopped trying to be other people and I started to say, I just need to be myself. So there's a church in Atlanta. We pastored in Atlanta before moving here. And there's a large church in Atlanta called 12 Stone. I mean, probably one of the top five churches. A couple years ago, it was the fastest growing church in America. It's huge. It's led by this guy. Now he's, he's kind of uh, stepped down as founding senior pastor and brought up his successor. But this guy named Kevin Myers was the individual who started 12 Stone. And nobody knows Kevin Myers. Like when it comes to like celebrity pastors, like people don't know him because he wasn't trying to make a name for himself. He was just stewarding what God was doing. And so there was this guy who was the very first employee that Kevin hired to help him launch 12 Stone. And this guy was now in his late 70s, early 80s, and he was dying from cancer. At our church at that time, we had an individual who was a hospice chaplain who was serving this guy, going to his house and doing re regular chaplain visits. And he said, hey, would you mind if my, my two pastors come and spend some time with you? Just to hear about your life, the stuff you did, the work that you did, and helping 12 Stone become what it is. He's like, oh yeah, I'd love that. So the guy I co-pastored with, his name was Jeff. Jeff and I go visit this guy. Oddly enough, I, I don't remember his name. Like the guy I spent time with that day, I, I don't remember his name. What I do remember is we had this fascinating conversa conversation where he told us the story of 12 Stones Rise to one of, being one of the largest churches in, in, the, in America. And near the end of our conversation, he just made this comment, you know, like, I would have loved to have been Kevin Myers. I would have loved to have been the guy who launched that all. But I can honestly say, now that I'm at the end of my life, I'm very content with the role that I had 
serving him. And so we left that conversation, and I remember it was this rainy day in Atlanta driving back, and I was like, I don't want to get to the end of my life and say I wish I was somebody else. Like, I want the contentment that that guy has, where I can look, and there's all these other people who've done all of these great things, but I'm so glad that I am who I am. Because if I tried really hard to be all of these other people, what I would miss is myself. And I would miss what God has given me, what God is doing in me, what God has entrusted to me, because there's so many good, glorious things in my life because I'm me. And I'm not trying to be somebody else. See, when we live that way, Oftentimes when we're trying to be somebody else, it usually comes from a mindset of I have something to prove. I have something to prove. John the Baptist had nothing to prove because he knew who he wasn't. And so my question for you this morning is do you ever live with that sense of I've got something to prove? Like, this is my moment. Nobody expected me to be in this position, but here I am, and now I've got to prove to people that I'm competent. Now I've got to prove to people that I'm able, and I'm smart, and I'm capable. I've got to prove to people that I'm tough and resilient, and I can withstand the pressure. I've got something to prove. Are you in a place where you feel like you have something to prove? And then the next question is, to who? Like, who are you trying to prove it to? Is it yourself? Do you have this tape playing in your head from things your parents have said? You'll never, and you're like, I got to prove to my parents, even though my parents are long gone. They've been off this earth forever, but I still have to prove something to them. Do you feel like you have to prove something to God? As you're looking at the lives of other people, do you say, God, why not me? Why is that? not me, and I'm going to prove to you, God, that that should have been me. Do you feel like you've got something to prove? And to whom? See, John, not only did he know who he wasn't, but because he knew who he wasn't, he also knew who he was. This is verse 22. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice. The first thing John says is, I am a voice. I'm a voice. Specifically, he says, of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. See, in the same way that the priests and Levites ask about figures and Old Testament references and trying to figure out who John is, when he finally comes to the point where he's going to tell tell them who he is, he is also quoting from the Old Testament. Here, when he says, make straight the way of the Lord, I'm the voice of the one calling in the wilderness, he's quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah 40. Now, what's, what's important to note about why he's quoting Isaiah here is Isaiah is broken up into two parts. There's two major parts in the book of Isaiah. The first part goes chapters 1 through 39. The second part goes chapter 40 through 66. Now, the first part of Isaiah is all about Israel's disobedience, the disobedience of Israel and the nation and how God is going to bring consequences on them because of their disobedience, namely exile and captivity in Babylon. That's their, their, their consequence for disobeying God's call and his leading on their life. But then as you move into chapter 40, it's about salvation. Because yes, there's consequence for their disobedience, but God is a God who doesn't give up on his promises. God is a God who doesn't give up on his people. And even though they wander stray and disobey, he says to them, hey, I'm still going to make a way for you. And so chapter 40 all the way to the end of Isaiah 66 is about deliverance. It's about salvation. It's about redemption. Now, in American history, there's this story of Paul Revere, right? Paul Revere is known for warning troops, militia groups in America, that British troops were coming and going to attack them. And the folklore version 
of Paul Revere's story is that he rode on horseback and he ran through the streets in Massachusetts yelling what? The British are coming. The British are coming. Now, nobody really knows if that is actually what he did and if he actually said those words and how he warned people. But he's trying to get people's attention that something is coming. Now, when John the Baptist says he's a voice, he's working in the same way. He's trying to get people's attention. He's trying to get them ready. He's trying to get them prepared. And he's not so much warning them about an impending attack, but he's a warning them about salvation. He's trying to get their attention that salvation is here. And so the John the Baptist folklore version of Paul Revere's story is that John was going through the streets of Israel saying, salvation is coming, salvation is coming, salvation is coming, get ready because it's coming and it's here. By quoting chapter 40, verse 3, which marks the beginning of the salvation story in Isaiah, John is trying to say there is a new chapter in our story, a chapter not marked by disobedience, exile, and captivity, but a new chapter Mark, by salvation, redemption, and deliverance. Get ready. It's coming. It's here. He says, I am a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Now, not only is John a voice, but he's also a pointer. We read in verse 24, now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Now, stop there just for a second. It said that the Jewish leaders at the beginning sent priests and Levites And now here we're told in verse 24, not only are priests and Levites sent, but another group of people has been sent, the Pharisees. Lots of people are being sent to interrogate John to try and figure out who he is. And they said, why do you baptize if you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? Now, as his name implies, as Miss Jackie said, the reason he's called John the Baptist is because he was baptizing people, which would have been really odd for the people of Israel. Because baptism was a thing in the first century Jewish world, but it was reserved for Gentile converts. It was reserved for people who weren't Jewish, who wanted to become Jewish, and one of the things they did in their conversion was to undergo baptism. But John's not baptizing Gentile converts. He's baptizing Jewish people. In a sense, he's making a statement with this that something in our religious system is broken. We have lost our way. We have missed the mark. And we need to be readied and prepared for a new chapter where salvation is coming because there is one who is going to come and fix what is broken. The purpose of his baptism was to get people's attention to get ready for the one who will make things that are broken right. He says this in verse 26, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you don't know. Oh, doesn't that create suspense? There's somebody who's already here. It's a person who we don't know. He could be standing in our midst at this very moment. He says, he is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. All this happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Essentially what John is saying is, This isn't about me. It doesn't matter who I am. Sure, I'm a voice. Sure, I'm a pointer. But it doesn't matter who I am because this isn't about me because there's one who is greater than me. Verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look. Now, the text doesn't say he pointed, but I imagine that he did. Look, that's the guy. He's the one. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. He's the guy that you've been looking for. The reason John has nothing to prove is because it's not about him. His role is simply to point to the one who does. And Jesus has nothing to prove because he knows who he is and he knows what he has come to do. And when you know who you're not and when you know who you are, it frees you just to be you. 
You don't have to live with the pressure. You don't have to live in fear. All you have to do is go out and do what you've been called to do. So go back to Brock Purdy. 2022, he gets his chance to play, to play against the Miami Dolphins. He wins that game. That's the, the game that Jimmy Garoppolo goes down. This is a picture of the press conference that he gives, that post-game press conference, after the game where they're just asking him questions and they're asking about how it felt going in, what he did to prepare. And near the end of his six-minute interview, somebody said, you've kind of always been a fearless player, haven't you? He's like, yeah, that's right. Where does that come from? And he says, well, I believe in the Lord. And I trust in Him. And that enables me to throw fear out the window and just go and play. See, when you have nothing to prove and you have nothing to lose and your confidence is rooted in Jesus, it sets you free to go do the thing that you are called to do. And what John the Baptist teaches us is simply this. You've got nothing to prove, just a person to whom you point. Your job, your role is the same as John's. You've got nothing to prove. You also have nothing to lose. Jesus has secured everything for you. Your job is to point to him and who he is. And notice the language John uses. There's two titles he gives him when pointing. First, he calls him the Lamb of God in verse 29. That speaks to his role on the cross and what he will do in securing salvation for the entire world. And the second one is the last part of his testimony when he reflects on the moment when he actually baptized Jesus, verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Jesus is said to be the Lamb of God <clears throat> who takes away the sin of the world and the chosen one on whom God's power and authority rests. Now, there's lots of times in life when you are not the chosen one that's really discouraging and really disappointing. You were looked over for a job. You wanted to be on that team. You wanted to be selected for this award, and you are not chosen, and that's really discouraging. And sometimes when you're <clears throat> not chosen, you also feel the pressure to prove yourself that I should have been. But sometimes there's good news when you're not chosen because you realize there is actually somebody who is more worthy than you for whatever that thing you're not chosen for. And the good news in Jesus <clears throat> is that because he's chosen and we are not, we too are chosen because of him. It says in Ephesians 1, in him, God chose you in him before the foundation of the world. In him, God chose you. In love, he chose you because of what Jesus did for you. Your choosing, God choosing you, isn't based on your performance. His choosing you isn't based on anything you have to prove. It's simply that your confidence in your identity, in your sense of being, is all wrapped up in Him. And so you have nothing to prove, just a person to whom you point. So we ask, what do you have to prove? Maybe that's not the question we should be asking. The question we should be asking is to whom or to what does your life point? Is it Jesus or is it something else? And if it's Jesus, oh, you have freedom. You have nothing to prove. You have nothing to lose because it's all been done for you by him. And so I can't think of any better way to end this moment than going before the Lord's table. Because it's this simple meal that, again, points to Jesus, points to who he is, points to what he has done for you in laying his life down being ripped apart, broken, his blood spilled for the sin of the world. 
You have nothing to earn. You have nothing to work for. You have nothing to prove with God, <clears throat> but simply a call to rest in Him and know that in Him, everything is secure. So, may this meal this morning remind you that you have nothing to prove. May it remind us that our lives are supposed to point to Him. And may it remind us of what Jesus has done for us in that He is the chosen one so that we too might be chosen.